Mr. Brown. I want to thank you for your patience with my voice. It leaves a lot to be desired, but I gotta tell you, it's a blessing from God that I have a voice. The last 20 years of my work at A-World, I was a teacher down at Arlington Beach High School. I taught social studies. As far as I was concerned, I had the best job in the world. A noble calling, teaching subjects that I loved. History, which is my passion. But I started to notice certain things. The students were apathetic. They didn't show an overall attitude of respect. It got very, very ugly, very depressing. They're abandoned all on it. What's down is up and up it's down. So, not too long into my retirement, I was reflecting on my career. And I had awards in the wall, teacher of the year. And I realized the students were failing in the test of life. They lack character, honesty. And that meant I was a failure. And I got very depressed. I wanted to fix it, but I couldn't. I wanted to cry. And then I started looking deeper into me. And it didn't take me long before I realized, hey, I'm part of the problem. And I've tried to do this. I tried to do that. I thought it was working. But it's not. What's missing? And I knew right away what was missing. God was missing in my life. Luckily, my brother told me that there was a Bible-based church in Huntington Beach. It was wonderful. It was almost unbelievable. People were really nice. And I know, I don't know them any money. Why are they being this nice? I heard this sermon. And it's like somebody slapped me in the forehead. I went, wow. I didn't like what I was hearing. But in my soul, Enough what I was hearing. He goes, yeah, that's what you came to hear. And it was. So from that day on, I kept going back because I realized I was hearing the truth. And I wasn't getting that from myself. I wasn't getting that from society. So I heard the gospel. I knew the gospel. I thought, but it really took root. Jesus loved me so much that he came down and saved me. And I was awash in the word. And like many new Christians, I was happy and eager for more. And I started to change. And I realized the power of the word that was changing me. Now reading Leviticus, strangely enough, except that chapter on leprosy, has been fascinating. And I love the lesson Bobby taught us about approaching God and how the two sons of Aaron got toasted because they just did what they wanted. And that's kind of like the way I was living. 
That's what I see in America. The promised land. And the thing that God I really hates, all those things and abomination that are happening in Canaan, they're happening here. On the news every day. So we're getting so we're almost numb. It's amazing. How great America is falling. So we have to watch out that we don't become like the tribes in Canaan. We have to take the lessons that Leviticus has for us. Thank you. Well, let's thank Steve Brown for sharing with us here on Torology. You know, I can remember when Steve got diagnosed with throat cancer and they did that surgery to remove his voice box. And I remember going to so many radiation and chemotherapy appointments with Steve. He's in my fellowship group. He and I have become really good friends. And I can remember a consistent prayer that Steve had even when he couldn't speak was that God would renew his voice and he would be able to share the gospel with people again and he'd be able to speak words of encouragement to people here at church again. And can we just take a moment to thank God for answering that prayer? I'm pretty sure Steve just spoke to us and we were encouraged here in Torology. And I, I wanna share with you an experience I had reading the book of Leviticus that was really profound in my life. It was one day I, when I got up, I can remember where I was in my house and I got there and I started reading Leviticus chapter 18. And as I was going through the words, it kept saying, uncover nakedness. And it was a phrase that was repeated over and over and over. And as I was looking through the chapter, all of a sudden it hit me, like when it talked about uncovering the nakedness of all these different people, I thought to myself, is this equivalent to what happens when people look at pornography on the internet today? And then as I was reading through, it talked about offering the children to Molech. And I was like, wait a minute, is this talking about abortion? And all of a sudden, even though I was reading Leviticus 18, it felt like I was reading about the United States of America. In fact, I got to this line in verse 22, you shall not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. And it just made me think about this whole homosexual revolution we've witnessed in our country. I can remember growing up and hearing people mock and make fun uh, of people who would claim to be homosexual and, and now it's gone to widespread acceptance. And I've just seen that whole change in our culture right in front of my eyes. And here it is saying it's an abomination. And as I kept reading, it talked about all the nations, the nations behind them in Egypt, the nations before them in Canaan and how these nations are doing things that it calls here abominations things that God hates, things that are loathsome and vile. And if the nation does these abominations, it's like the very land that the nation is on gets sick and the very land that the nation is on wants to vomit the nation. And that's why God is sending his people to go and judge the nations that are in the land of Canaan, the land that he's now promised to the Israelites. They're gonna go judge them because they've been committing these abominations. And there's a strong warning here to Israel, if you commit the same abominations, if you do the same evil things in God's sight, well, then the same judgment will come on you that will come upon all the nations. And what happened in my heart when I was reading that day is Leviticus became a page turner for me. It became compelling reading because I felt like I was reading the future of the United States of America, my country, the land that I love that over the years, I've had to see that there's been a, a fall of a once great nation in America and that really, this wasn't just about the nation of Israel. This was about my nation, my country, and my fellow Americans that we are committing 
abominations. I mean, the amount of people, as I've been working at church through my adult life, the amount of other men I've talked to about pornography, uh, the amount of abortions that happen every year in the United States of America and the controversy that came when Roe v. Wade was overturned was, uh, was just a intense division in our nation over this issue of abortion, the spread of the idea of homosexuality among the young people in our land. It's like I'm reading what is happening in my life in Leviticus chapter 18. And I immediately felt uh, frustrated. I remember I felt very frustrated when I read this. And I was like, why did I let myself think and why maybe did other people who taught me the Bible, why did we get the impression that the law of Moses was just for Israel and it was old and it wasn't really relevant to our lives today? Why did I ever believe that lie when Leviticus 18 is explaining to me what's happening in my lifetime right here in my country? And, and so Leviticus 18 uh, had a powerful effect on my life. And I really want to share that with you. In fact, I want to go over three chapters with you in this video. And, and this video, hopefully, Lord willing, it'll come online the day we're reading Leviticus 18 together as a church. And so this video will cover Leviticus 18 to 20. And, and the abominations that are introduced to us in Leviticus 18, I want to make this very clear. I want to make sure that you can understand something that I didn't come across till much later in my life. The abominations in Leviticus 18 apply to all nations, any place, any time. And, and uh, it, let's just start going through Leviticus 18, and then we'll see the consequences of these abominations in Leviticus 20, and then sandwiched in between those two chapters about the abominations is a chapter about the nation that God really wants his people to be because he's Yahweh and he's their God and, and they need to be holy as he is holy because I am Yahweh your God. So if you start with me in Leviticus 18 and maybe you could open up a Bible and go through Leviticus 18 to 20 with me. I, I just got a brand new journal from our book nook here at Compass HB I, and I was so inspired by going through Leviticus right now this time that I was like I want to start the journal all over again and Leviticus 18 starts like so so many of the chapters we're reading in Leviticus and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I hope you've memorized that verse by now. This is by my count here in Leviticus 18. This is the 20th time that it says that God spoke to Moses or Aaron or the people. And, I, I'm, and I'm trying to keep track. Hopefully by the end of Leviticus, we can tally up how many times does it say that the God is speaking from the mountain. That's the whole... Uh, thing of the book of Leviticus, all 27 chapters are God speaking from the mountain and he brings up where they were before in the land of Egypt back in Exodus and where they're going in the land of Canaan, which we're going to get to in the new year in Numbers. I'm very excited about that. First weekend of the new year, I'm going to preach from the book of Numbers at our church. And hopefully we can all read the book of Numbers together and all be numbered in the Lord's army. But uh, the land of Canaan is where they're going. And the clear call is you can't be like these other nations. And then he's going to get into the explanation of that. But he says in verse 4 and 5, these are famous verses from Leviticus 18, 4. You shall follow my rules and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am Yahweh your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my rules. If a person does them, he shall live by them. I am Yahweh. Now that idea that if you keep God's statutes, God's law, you will live by it. That's a famous verse here in Leviticus 18.5. And what I mean by famous is it's quoted in both Romans chapter 10 verse 4 and in Galatians chapter 3 verse 12. And so you can go and start studying how Paul quotes this verse. 
But what I'm excited to share with you, we've already seen a lot of Genesis and a lot of Exodus in Romans 9. When we get to Romans 10, we're gonna see Leviticus and we're gonna see Deuteronomy. So I love how God has it, that our study of Torology, looking for God in the law of Moses, is paralleling our study in Romans 9 and 10. But the idea is, hey, uh, uh, is Egypt just got judged and Israel saw it. Israel is gonna bring the judgment to the land of Canaan, a land devoted to destruction. And so if you don't wanna end up like these other nations, you need to listen to my statutes so you can live. That's God's promise to his people. Now, before he gets to his statutes, he describes the way the other nations are living, and that's where we get into the abominations. So uh, nudity and incest are definitely something that are, I mean, this is an intense chapter. And, and it, what's, what's really sad about Leviticus 18 is it's describing some serious sins that are becoming pretty common in the United States of America. Um, and there's a whole study you can do on offering children to Molech. If you wanna just jump down to verse 21 with me, clearly there's a lot of uh, sexual morality and adultery that is described through the repetition of uncovering nakedness. But then in verse 21, it says, you shall not give any of your children to offer them to Molech. And then in verse 22, it talks about lying, a man lying with a man like a woman, and that's the first time it uses this word abomination. And that is gonna be our Hebrew word that I really wanna bring to your attention. It's toiva, which is this word abomination. And I brought with me my kumash here that I picked up on the streets of Jerusalem back when we went there last summer. And it, once you uh, open the kumash and you open it from the right to the left, right? Cause it's in Hebrew. We're getting pretty far into it now at this point to get to Leviticus 18. And y'all, I'll just show you here. Once it says abomination once, it starts using that word a bunch of times here in the second part of Leviticus 18 because uh, this is clearly the point of this chapter. It's given us specific examples, but these are all under one heading of abominations. And if a nation allows these abominations to continue, that nation is going to be wiped off the land that they live on. You can't let Israel commit these abominations. That's the point here in Leviticus 18. And a great cross-reference that uses our Hebrew word toiva is Deuteronomy 18, nine to 14. And Deuteronomy 18, nine to 14, I want you to turn there with me right now. Deuteronomy 18, nine says, when you come into the land that Yahweh your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. So even in Deuteronomy, the second telling of the law, it's gonna go back to this idea of Leviticus 18. And so this is what we're getting to now. In the book of Leviticus, that God wants his people to be holy, and holy means to be set apart. God wants his people to be separate from the other peoples. Now, this isn't about uh, any kind of racism of not wanting to have other peoples blend in with God's people. That's not what it's about. And Leviticus 19 will make that clear. You love all your neighbor as yourself. You love the sojourner who's there in your midst, who's not even one of you. No, God wants us to love all people. No, this is about these other nations are committing these abominations and therefore these other nations will be judged. And so we, in Israel, you can't go live like the other nations or you'll end up like the other nations. And if you know the whole story of Israel, you, if you know the Hebrew Bible, you know that they will end up being judged and exiled for 70 years because they commit these same abominations. In fact, it does seem like the way of the nations is that eventually a nation becomes an abomination to God, that seems to be the pattern of how the nations go. And so there's this strong statement here about not killing your children and not offering them to Molech. And I really do think 
that, that from our study of Molech and other occasions, that is similar to the abortion that is taking place in our nation today. There's even a lot about mediums, necromancers, one who inquires of the dead here in Deuteronomy 18 that it gets into in Leviticus 20 as well. So these are all things that if nations allow these things to continue, they can expect judgment. And so I guess after I got past my frustration, I felt a great sense of alarm. I just felt like, and this has happened to me a few times, not, not just based on what's been happening in our nation, but also based on really my, my rediscovery of the Hebrew Bible. I've come to see that America is not something I can put any confidence in. In fact, I should really probably expect that maybe in my lifetime, judgment will come to the United States of America because we are embracing the abominations that God hates and we don't care that God hates them. In fact, I'm hearing more and more people imply that God is the bad guy for even hating these things. And so uh, being comfortable with with nudity and uncovering nakedness and sexual morality with people who aren't married and uh, abortion as, as kind of a consequence of that sexual morality to try to cover it up in a very wrong way and, and homosexuality and the acceptance of that. And then it even gets into bestiality. I mean, these kinds of things, if they're becoming common, we just need to know that God hates that. And if that's what we're gonna do in the United States of America, then God is gonna hate us here in this nation. And so that sense of alarm, it, it really had actually a very good effect in my life because it made me want to pray for the United States of America. It made me actually care and have compassion for my fellow Americans. In fact, when I look back on uh, the study of the book of Leviticus, when we preached sermons and, and my, my compelling reading of Leviticus 18 led to this sermon, What's Wrong with America? that I preached at our church. And, and uh, I, I have my sermon notes from the sermons on Leviticus and you can see when we started Leviticus, for some reason, I, I got my notes in these horizontal pages. And then it was on this sermon, What's Wrong with America, that my notes changed where they went to then a vertical layout on the pages. And you can tell like from that moment in the preaching at our church, my notes were much more detailed than they'd ever been. Really from preaching Leviticus in January of 2020 until this day, 47 sermons deep in the book of Romans, uh, reading Leviticus that day, I was so concerned about what's happening to our country that it made me more uh, focused uh, when I was preparing for sermons. It made me pay closer attention to scripture and it made me want to see a revival that would come from the Bible. And I had to kind of humble myself that maybe I wouldn't get to see a revival all across the land of America, but I could see some souls get revived here in Huntington Beach. And, and I wanna tell you that as God is saving people here at our church, people are turning from sexual morality. People who used to think abortion was okay, they have changed their political views. People who have had abortions in the past have come to realize the guilt of their sin and have been forgiven for it. People who uh, were getting caught up in uh, the common uh, acceptance of homosexuality and, and and looking at homosexual images on the internet, they are repenting of that and turning from that. And I am talking to people that God is saving out of the abominations of our nation. And so I gotta tell you, this, this passage of scripture, I, I don't think I'll ever forget the profound impact that it had on me when we looked at it almost four years ago now. And if you've never really studied Leviticus 18, 19, and 20, I'm praying that this reading will have a profound impact on you in the same way. In fact, just go with me now through Leviticus chapter 19, if you can turn there with me and just notice 
the way that this chapter flows is completely different than the chapter before it. Uh, I just, uh, I've been circling every time it says Yahweh in my text. Every time you see the capital L-O-R-D, that's a Yahweh. And, and this chapter is like, no, 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 you're not gonna do the abominations of the nations because you're my people and I'm Yahweh and I'm your God. And so it just starts going through here over and over, I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. And, and it says, um, you got to do what is holy to the Lord. Don't profane the name of the Lord. And it goes through all these different commands. And you can just see at verse 10, verse 12, verse 14, verse 16, verse 18, it all ends with I am Yahweh. Here's why you got to do this. Because you got to listen to my rules so that you can live. Because you're my people and you can't be like those other nations. And uh, Leviticus 19:18 is actually another famous scripture. It's got a great command to love your neighbor as yourself. Most people don't know that that second greatest command, as Jesus calls it, in Matthew 22, 39, Mark 12, 31, Luke 10, 27, they all talk about the second greatest command. I don't know how many people could say that the second greatest command is from Leviticus 19, 18. But God's saying, we're not gonna be racist in Israel. We're not gonna hate other people. No, we're gonna love our neighbors. We're gonna welcome in the sojourners. We're gonna remember that we were once sojourners in Egypt and that if God didn't save us out of there, we would still be slaves. So we're gonna treat other people with the same love that they had received from Yahweh. I mean, you could go do a deeper study on loving your neighbor as yourself. And Romans 13, 9, Galatians 5, 14, James 2, 8, they talk about this, like, hey, if you can learn how to do this, like this is a good summary of the law. That's really the question they're asking when they're trying to stump Jesus. When they ask him, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And they think they've caught Jesus in a word trap because how could you say one commandment is greater than the others? Well, Jesus says the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart. And we'll get to that in Deuteronomy 6, 4 in the Shema. But he says the second is like it. And Jesus says that this is one of the most important commandments in Leviticus 19, 18. You want to summarize all that God is saying in the law? Well, here's a great way to summarize it. Love other people as you would yourself. And that's what Paul's teaching when he's bringing up Leviticus 19, 18 in Romans and Galatians or when James is talking about it in James 2, 8. If you could really learn how to think of others in the same way you think about yourself, you're really learning how to live God. God's way and God wants people to live his way because that's the best possible experience for human flourishing. Like God does not want people to commit abominations because then they get judged and it's not good for those nations to commit the abominations. So if you do what God says, you will be blessed. That's the idea. Walk in my ways and you will live, God's trying to say. So if you know somebody who's committing the abominations that are described here in Leviticus 18 to 20. And you think, well, why would God hate that, what that person is doing or what that person is identifying with? You just gotta realize that the reason God hates it is because he knows that's not what's best for that person. God created us. God knows what is best for us. And if he hates it, he hates it because he knows that's not the way to go. That's not going to lead to the blessing of that nation. That will lead to death. It will lead to judgment. And so God wants his people to learn his ways so that they can flourish. And the consequences uh, of, of what happens when you commit these abominations, when you get to Leviticus 20. And I really hope you'll, you'll take reading these chapters so seriously. When you get to Leviticus 20, and, and I've seen this happen right here at our church, because it's gonna say, if anybody offers their children to Molech, you should put that person to death. And I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen right here when people realize what they did when they had that abortion. It's like a horrifying thing to realize. People have run up to me, convicted, eyes open to their sin. I mean, we gotta realize that the wages of sin is what, everybody? 
Like sin deserves death. There's, there's a good summary statement from the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus should not be known for leprosy. I hate to, I hate to, you know, say something about my friend Steve and his lovely introduction to this video, but Steve, you had to, you had to shoot down leprosy. And Steve and I, we like to get into it in our fellowship group sometimes. And I remember my other friend, and I don't want to pick a bone with him, but my good brother in the Lord, Kyle Hoodman, remember when he said, what are we going to have on the cover of the Leviticus booklet? Some kind of skin disease? No, we put gold on the, on the copy of, uh, Levit Leviticus on the cover of the booklet. We put, now if we were redoing it, I would put blood all over the cover of Leviticus because I think that's a good thing to say to summarize the book of Leviticus is that sin deserves death. And the only way that the, you can have atonement for sin is through blood. I mean, that's what Leviticus is teaching us with the sacrifices, with the priests and the atonement that they have through the blood. But now we're getting to what are these sins? And if someone, if someone offers their child to Molech in Israel, put that person to death because we can't let that start spreading among God's people. Wow. So when we go through these sins here, I, I just wanna to speak to people at our church and I wanna say, if you, find the guilt of your sin very heavy here. Hey, let's just take a moment to remember that Jesus died in your place and he paid for that sin. His blood was shed for that sin. So yes, feel guilty about your sin, but celebrate the forgiveness that you have in Jesus Christ. And if you read through this and you kind of feel this sense of, of righteous indignation, you kind of get a sense of what God means when he says abomination, that God's angry about it, that God hates it. And if you feel that way about our fellow Americans, um, I wanna encourage you not to think in this judgmental way towards um, uh, other people in America. God's the one who's gonna bring the judgment on America. He doesn't need your help doing that. You know, you need to have compassion. And, and when you pray for America, pray in a we, us, and our kind of a way, like you're an American. We have a problem with abortion. We have accepted the sin of homosexuality. We have made pornography commonplace. We are the problem. The problem's not some group of people out there that is America. The problem is us, and I'm an American. And we are a land that deserves to be judged. We are a nation that deserves to die. That's what Leviticus 20 is saying, and judgment is coming. I mean, it just even says things like in Leviticus 20, 14. I mean, this is a graphic verse even just to read. It says, if a man takes a woman and her mother also, it is depravity. He and they shall be burned with fire. That's the kind of stuff that people are joking about in America. And it's deadly serious in the book of Leviticus. So I don't know how we can have this conversation here without feeling a sense of, of heaviness of what's going on in the United States of America. You know, when, when we read through this law, it wasn't too long after we read this that COVID happened. And when COVID happened, I remember really thinking, is this like the beginning of the judgment on our land? And I remember when we get to Leviticus 26, it's gonna talk about some of the judgment that will come upon God's people if they don't obey the commands as he said them in this book. And one of the things it says in Leviticus 26, 16 is then I will do this to you. Like this is what's gonna happen if you don't do what God tells you to do here in Leviticus. I will do this to you. I will visit you with panic, with wasting disease and fever. And I was like, wait a minute. Was the fear and fever of COVID like an early stage of God's judgment because we're not doing what he's told us? It, I mean, and maybe this is me taking it too far, but 
The idea that God is gonna judge America has gotten into my brain from the book of Leviticus. Like there's one thing that God says, even, even after the fear and the fever come, and that's how it was for me. I don't know what your experience was with COVID, but I saw a whole lot of fear before I ever got the fever. And then eventually I did get the fever and it was the worst sickness I ever had in my life. And so, wow, is that God judging? Well, it says if you continue to walk contrary to God's ways, even after the fear and fever, this is literally what it says in Leviticus 20, 26, 22. And I will let loose the wild beasts among you. Like, I, I don't know if it's just me, but is it just like there's more pests than we've ever had before in our lives these days? Is it just me or do the coyotes run freely through the streets of Huntington Beach? Like the other night, it was like 6 p.m. at night and my son and I were coming in from parking and walking into our house where we live in the city limits of Huntington Beach and you could hear a pack of coyotes howling to the point where my son and I, my son who's a young man and myself a grown man, we did not want to go walking in the streets of Huntington Beach that night because of the pack of coyotes howling. Now, is, is that me taking uh, God's idea of judgment too far maybe from the book of Leviticus? Am I stretching to apply that to America? Perhaps, but let me tell you this, one thing that I have come to see is judgment is coming to the United States of America. And I want to see Jesus save as many people as possible, as many souls as we are able here in Huntington Beach before that happens. And so I hope you go through all that I felt, like the alarm at what you're reading, the frustration of why has no one told me this before, the sense of just like, wow, this is happening where I live. And then like this burden, this profound sense of I gotta do something about this. And I, I don't know what I can do. I'm not gonna uh, run for the presidency. I'm not declaring my candidacy here in this video. I don't know what I can do to change the course of something as big and vast as the United States of America. But I know the way God wants me to live my life here in Huntington Beach that God wants me to be separate, that he wants me to be holy. It says at the end of Leviticus 20, verse 26, you shall be holy to me, for I, Yahweh, am holy and have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. And even if the whole nation doesn't wanna be separate from the abominations of all the other nations, then I might have to be separate even in my own nation. I might have to be holy even from my fellow Americans. I need to be somebody that lives by God's rules, that is set apart, that is called out, that is one of the people of God and not just a citizen of this nation, but a citizen of heaven. And so I'm praying for my sanctification. I'm praying for your sanctification. I'm praying that as we read these words of truth, that God will use them to set us apart, to set us apart from the sin that surrounds us and to set us apart to God, to Yahweh, for his purpose, to be his people. So yes, I am one of the people of the United States of America, but I also have to be set apart from those people because I'm one of the people of God. And that's what I think, man, Leviticus 18, 19, 20, it's like it's ripped from the headlines. It's like telling us the current events, the news. It's totally about you and me here today. And so I hope these are sobering words. I hope these are words that give you a wake-up call, that make you alert, and that bring about in your heart a revival that comes from the Bible. And I'd love to see that spread across our land. So thank you for looking at Leviticus 18 to 20 with me. And I hope to see you for more here on Scripture of the Day. Merry Christmas to all of you who are leaving comments on these videos. I love reading through every single one of them. I left some comments myself to some of you. You won a peppermint drink at Trolley Coffee. And if you keep leaving comments, 
you can win a free trip to Israel. And if you don't know what to leave on this video, well, leave a comment praying for the USA based on all we learned from Leviticus 18 to 20. So Merry Christmas to the commenters. And I also wanted to say Merry Christmas to the pigs around here. Merry Christmas, you filthy animals.